<laughs> hey, Brother Roy here, Old School Bible Baptist Ministries. You know, you hear people say all the time that uh, it's not a salvation issue, brother. Uh, don't We don't need to go there. It's not a salvation issue. But listen, doctrine is important. Doctrine will determine how you live. What you believe determines how you live, how you feel. It may not be a salvation issue all the time, but it'll be a joy issue. It'll be a victory issue. It'll be an effectiveness for the Lord issue. And that's why we want to talk today is why rightly dividing is so important. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the blood that was shed. God, we thank you for your King James Bible uh, that you've revealed and saved every word perfect for us today. And Father, we just ask now that uh, you take this old jailbird from the slammer out of the way and uh, give me something to say that would help these folks and draw them closer to you, closer to your word, and bring honor and glory to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, so what's important here is rightly dividing. And if you don't have a King James Bible, well, you're not going to know about that anyway, because 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. No other Bible says study or rightly dividing. And then as you get into the Pauline epistles, four times Paul identifies those right divisions and calls them dispensations. But uh, if you don't have a King James Bible, you're not going to have the word dispensations in it either. So you're not going to be able to rightly divide or study and really know what the Bible says unless you have a King James Bible, number one. Number two, it, once you get a King James Bible and you can rightly divide and you've got the right words, then there are some divisions. Amen? What? Old Testament, New Testament. Big division. We'll talk about that in a second. But look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Here's an important division. When you're reading your Bible, you want to know <laughs> who is God talking to in this verse? Because every single verse is not talking to everybody, the same people, right? So here's, here's just a real simple one, real simple. And keep this in mind. When you read the rest of the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32, giving none offense, neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles, who's a Gentile, anybody that's not a Jew, nor to the church of God. He gives you three classifications of people right there. You're either a Jew, a Gentile, or if you've been saved, if you're born again, whether you're Jew or Gentile, then you are in the church of God in this day, in this dispensation right now. So Jew, Gentile, church of God. Now, when we go back and we read in scripture, we say, okay, who's being spoken to or about here? Jew, Gentile? or Church of God. Amen? What we're talking about, if you looked at the little cartoon that was in the thumbnail, we're talking about some end-time stuff. What we believe about the rapture, or the catching away, or the our gathering together unto Him, what we believe about that will determine how we live our life, how we feel, what we expect. Amen? So let's get into that a little bit, if you will. So everyone goes, when they start talking about the rapture, everyone goes to Matthew chapter 24 for some reason. All right? So go to Matthew chapter 24 and... Let's see why that's not where you're supposed to go when you're talking about the rapture of the church, which is his body. Matthew chapter 24, go about start a, a, a 20, about verse 29. He says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, okay, so 
So this is happening after the seven-year period of tribulation. This is, this is something that happens after the tribulation. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the one end of heaven to the other. Okay? And people who do not know how to rightly divide think that this is talking about the rapture or the catching away of the church. But back up a little bit. Remember our Jew, Gentile, church of God. Amen? Think about this. When Jesus is speaking this, who is he talking to? Well, first of all, <laughs> there were no Gentiles around. He's the Messiah of Israel. He said, I've only come to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So that in his, in his ministry on earth, he was ministering to his people. He was the Messiah, the King of Israel, and he'd come to minister to his, to his people. So there weren't any, he wasn't speaking to a Gentile crowd in Matthew chapter 24 or the parallel passages, Luke 21 or Mark 14. He's not speaking to a Gentile crowd. All right. And guess who else he's not speaking to? He's not speaking to the church of God. Why do you say that, Brother Roy? Well, go with me, since you're right there in Matthew. Look at Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. Jesus is talking to Peter, right? And he says, uh, And I say unto thee, uh, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Upon this rock, and, and Christ is talking about himself. He says, upon this rock, me, I will build my church. He didn't say, I am building my church, or I have built my church. See, this is future tense. It's future tense. Why? Because the church the body of Christ is built upon the finished work of Jesus Christ. It's not part of the old covenant to Israel. The church is a brand new thing, and it is built upon the gospel. What is the gospel? The death, burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no church, which is his body. The church of God does not exist before Calvary, before he goes to Calvary. So look right here in Colossians 2.14 on that subject. Colossians 2 and verse 14. Because up until the cross, we're still under the old covenant. We're still under the law, right? What, is, what, what does Hebrews say? Uh, uh, that there's no testament without the death of the testator. And then when you get to Colossians and 2 and 14, he says right here, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, that's the law, that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. All right, so the, the law ends at the cross. The dispensation of the law ends at the cross. What, what starts after the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, that's the church age, the age of grace. 
Notice what happens in Matthew chapter 27 when Jesus dies. Matthew 27, uh, let's go to about verse 50. And Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. He died on the cross. And what's the next thing that happens? And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. That was it for the law, huh? The, the law, the whole Jewish religious system going into the Holy of Holies through the veil, through the veil, into the altar, into the ark, all of that. They say, once Jesus paid for everything once and for all, for all time, God reached down, they said, from the top to the bottom, and he ripped the veil of the temple open now, once and for all, in the body of Christ, in Christ, we all can make come boldly before the throne of God. This is the beginning of the church. This is the beginning of New Testament salvation. All right? So all that to say, back in Matthew chapter 24, when he's talking about this end time stuff, He's not talking to Gentiles. He's not talking to the church of God. There is no church of God yet. He's talking to Jews, right? And how do I know that? Well, they knew that. Look at Ezekiel chapter 37. This is Ezekiel's vision of the valley of the dry bones. And uh, so... Verse 9, and he said, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy a son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from what? The four winds. You know why God, why Jesus brought that up in Matthew chapter 24? Huh? He said he shall send his angels, right, from the four winds, amen, and that they would gather his elect, because he's referring them right back here to Ezekiel chapter 37 that any Jew already knew. He said, and the four winds breathe and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath came into them and they lived and stood upon their feet an exceeding great army. He looked at verse 12. Behold, halfway through, behold, oh, oh my people, who is his people? The, the Jews. I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, and what? And bring you into the land of Israel. Verse 14, And I shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live. Verse 21, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whether they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. That's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 14. He's talking about when he comes at his second advent, when his feet hit the Mount of Olives, when he sits down in the, on the throne of David in Jerusalem to rule and reign for a thousand years and fulfill all kingdom prophecy to the nation of Israel, the Jews will be resurrected and brought back into the land of Israel. That is not the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church at this point in time has not been revealed yet, and it's something entirely different. Now look with me. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 25. Now Paul's going to talk about this church of God. Remember, Jew, Gentile, church of God. So Jesus where we were just talking about, that's all Jesus talking to Jews. Now, here's Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, huh? who brings the revelation of the church, which is his body, 
the mystery. Here's Paul breaking down information for what? The church of God. He's not talking to the Jews now. He's talking to the church of God. Jesus wasn't talking to the church of God. He was talking to Jews. See how you have to rightly divide if you know what the Bible is talking to, who, and about, or you're just going to mush it all together, mix it up, and your theology is going to be in the toilet every single time. All right. So here's what he says in verse 25. Wherefore, I am made a minister according to what? According to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you. Why are we dispensationalists? Because the Bible is a dispensational book. Because Paul was a dispensationalist. Because he uses the term four times in telling us how to study and rightly divide. If you're not a dispensationalist, you're not a Bible student. He says, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery, what's a mystery? Something that has not yet been revealed. Even the mystery, which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That doesn't happen until the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a mystery. The whole church age, the whole church, which is his body, was all a mystery. It was hid. It was not revealed. Look at... Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of, here he goes again, huh? if you're not a dispensationalist, you know how to study the Bible, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, to you. Huh? Given the get the dispensation of the grace of God given to who? Given to the church of God. Amen. Not the Jew. Know who's being spoken to. You have to rightly divide. Verse three. How that by revelation he made known unto me what again the mystery. What's a mystery? Something that has not yet been revealed. This wasn't back there in Matthew chapter twenty four. Jesus was talking to Jews about Ezekiel chapter 37. It has nothing to do with the body of Christ, the church. Whereby, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Verse 5, which in other ages, what other ages? Under the law, in the Old Testament, which is other ages, was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And look down at verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been what? Hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So this was something that was hid in God. It was a mystery. It was not part of Old Testament prophecy. It was a mystery in Matthew chapter 24. It's not what Jesus was talking about. It's not what Ezekiel's talking about in Ezekiel 37. This is the regathering of the nation of Israel at Christ's second advent. The rapture or the catching away or are gathering together unto him as the body of Christ, as believers in Christ, is a completely different event. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's go to verse 51. Remember, mystery, something not yet revealed. Paul, 1 Corinthians. Chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. Okay. Something not revealed yet. Something not in Ezekiel 37. Not in Matthew 24. Not in Luke 21. 
Not in Mark 14. That was for the Jews. This is a mystery pertaining to the church of God. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump, trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. You see, the rapture, the catching away, our gathering together unto him of the church, which is his body, is a complete separate event from the gathering of Israel at the second advent. And that's a right division that'll split this thing wide open for you. And you'll, you'll know that here he's talking to the church of God, and here he's talking to the Jews. Two separate groups of people, two completely separate events. And why is that important now? Why is that important? All right. Well, look back at Matthew chapter 24. If you think Matthew chapter 24 is talking to you as a Christian and that you got to go through this whole tribulation period and you're waiting on his second advent, all right? Well, here's what you got coming. Verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world <laughs> to this time, nor, no, nor ever shall be. Man, he's saying this, this is going, it's going to be so bad. He said, it's never been this bad since the beginning of the world. And some pretty bad stuff happened since the beginning of the world. Noah's flood that happened since the beginning of the world. Some horrible things. He said, not only is this thing so bad, it's, it's worse than anything that ever happened. He said, this thing's worse than anything that's ever going to happen. That's what, you, hey, if you think that Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 14, all that stuff is talking to the church of God, then do you think the church of God has to experience that? See, verse 22, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Right? <laughs> that's what you got. That's, that, that's what you live with. You live, have to live in fear of the end times. You have to live in fear and expectation of going through this time of great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. Ah, <laughs> what an encouraging way to live. Amen. What a great thing to look forward to. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> no. Now, if you, if you rightly divide, and then you come over to a Pauline epistle addressed to what the church of God in what this dispensation, you know what you're looking forward to. Look with me now in Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. Titus 2, 13. Huh? This is, this is for you, Church of God, rightly divided, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Huh? Our great God, the blessed hope of his glorious, of his glorious appearing. And what happens then? <laughs> amen, amen, amen. For the dead in Christ shall rise first, then those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up in the air to be with the Lord. The, the Lord Jesus comes for his bride, his body, and he takes the church out, and the church age is over. That dispensation is done, and he turns back to dealing with the Jew again, because that's what the tribulation's for. It's Daniel's 70th week. It's part of Jewish prophecy. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. The tribulation 
is completely about Israel and it's only for the Jew. And we will be in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ, the marriage of the Lamb, and then at his glorious appearing, we, the armies in heaven, come back with him when he fulfills Ezekiel 37, resurrects Israel, sits on the throne of David. Oh, I'm telling you, a rightly divided King James Bible, clear up a theological college education every time. Well, God bless you. Uh, I don't know what you're looking forward to, but I'm looking forward to Jesus for that glorious appearing and that blessed hope. I'm not looking for the Antichrist or the Re revived Roman Empire or, 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 or the Mark of the Beast or any of that. <laughs> We're missing all that according to the rightly divided King James Bible. Amen. God bless you. I hope that was a blessing to you in Jesus' name. We'll see you in the next one.